Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I will fix the stove. I will thank our neighbor for their help. I will be there for you. I will help you move next Saturday. I'll meet you there tomorrow at 6 p.m. What do all those statements have in common? Well, we have a word that describes all of those statements, and that word is promise. Those are all promises, promises that the speaker is making to somebody else about something they're going to do in the future, right? They're going to fix the stove in the future at some point. They're going to go and thank their neighbor for helping them out. I will be there for you is a promise to be present when someone is in need, etc. Well, there's two really main elements to a promise. There's the actual speaking of the promise, the using of the words, and then there is the acting out and the fulfilling of the promise, so actually doing the thing that you say. And what's interesting is that when you think about fulfillment, even for simple promises, the fulfillment of that promise often takes you to places that you're not expecting when you make the promise in the first place. For example, a small promise like, I'm going to fix the stove, may end up being a bigger promise than you thought it was going to be. You might think, if you're like me and you consistently underestimate the time it's going to take to do home projects, that it's going to take only an hour. But once you get in there and you figure out that the problem might be a bit worse than you thought or gets a little more complicated to fix it, a one-hour job may take three or four hours, or it may even take a couple of days because now I've got to go to the store and buy a part or a tool I wasn't expecting. Well, in our scripture reading today, we are witnessing God's promises to His people and their fulfillment, and this element is present in the interaction between God and His people, that God needs to send His Son in the fulfillment of those promises And it certainly takes us and him places that we weren't expecting. And you can tell that by Nicodemus, a very learned teacher of the Scriptures. He has no idea what Jesus is talking about. So let's first start with God's promises in our Old Testament reading, the promises he made to Abram. The Lord says to Abram, and you can kind of count the promises following the pattern of the words that I said at the beginning of the sermon. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's a lot of promises in there, and none of them are of the order of I will fix the stove. You get through that list, and when you're thinking of what's being promised, the only thing you can think of is these are the sorts of promises only God can make. These vast, magnificent, open-ended promises, and just from those words alone, Abram has no idea how God is going to do any of those things. Even just the, the seeming preposterousness of the promise at the end of this list, which is, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, how the heck is he going to do that? There's no planes, there's no TV or radio, so how is all of the world going to be blessed through this promise to Abram? So talk about God-sized promises. But notice that when the promise is made, by its nature, a promise cannot be earned but only given. Even the simplest promise that you make to your children or to your spouse or to your friends, it can't be earned but only given. I will fix the stove. I will meet you tomorrow at 6 p.m. is a promise that only you, the promiser, can make. As soon as you say, if you buy me a soda, I will come and help you move next Saturday, or as in the seminary parlance we would say, just provide us beer and pizza and we'll be there, it's no longer a promise. Now it is an agreement with a condition. And Paul explains this aspect of promise in our Romans 4 reading today. He writes, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but his due. 
And so when it becomes something earned, it's no longer a gift but a wage. And then in the next verse he says, And to the one who does not work but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, his faith is counted as righteousness. And then to drive the point home, Paul hits on the exact promise given to Abraham. In verse 13 he says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. A promise given from God and believed. Now this aspect of the promise is so important that promise by their very nature are gifts that are unearned. Therefore, we have hope and certainty in our promises from God because they are given and ascertained by faith. They are not earned by doing certain things or saying certain things or being certain types of people, but gifts given. And Paul goes on to say that if this isn't the case, if it is somehow earned, it is null and emptied of its meaning. The promise is no good anymore, for it ceases to be a promise. And he says this in verse 14, For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. In other words, God's promises can be received no other way than faith. If they are in any way earned, the cross of Christ and His gifts are emptied of their power. They are no longer gifts, but wages due to a righteous person, of which Jesus teaches there are none. Then the object of faith ships from God's righteousness and faithfulness in His promises to us to one's own righteousness and faithfulness, and our certainty is gone. For the foundation of our righteousness and faithfulness is crumbling at every moment. So this brings us to the gospel reading for today. Nicodemus has come to Jesus in the night to talk, and Jesus is going to be talking about how God is fulfilling the promises that He's made. And as we can see, as I mentioned earlier with the example of the stove, it's a little bit more than a one-hour project, and many of us, in fact, no one, lest you give Nicodemus too hard a time, not even the disciples of Jesus know exactly what the fulfillment of these promises are going to entail. So Jesus starts by talking to Nicodemus about the fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures and the witness are in fact about him and his work, and he's talking about how God's going to actually carry out these promises. And Nicodemus has trouble grasping what Jesus says because he's focused on what he thinks is going to be needed in order for these things to come to pass. And for Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and not just any Pharisee, but one pretty high up, that is, as Paul was saying, as an adherent of the law, that you must do the right things and live the right kind of life in order for God's promises to be fulfilled in you. But then Jesus says a very strange thing in response to what Nicodemus says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you've heard that a bunch of times in church, so it sounds less weird to you, but I think Nicodemus has the normal human reaction to such, such a statement. Like, uh, how does that work? I mean, outside of the context of the Christian church, a phrase like being born again sounds like crazy talk, and it kind of is. And so Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And of course, that's preposterous. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But again, we see here this dynamic where God's fulfillment of His promise is something that we cannot predict or see or grasp apart from faith. Because notice the way that Nicodemus addresses Jesus at the beginning of this conversation. He doesn't say, Messiah, Son of God. He says, Rabbi, Teacher. He does not yet have the faith necessary to see what God is doing in Jesus and surely the way in which He's going to fulfill these promises. So Jesus then says another truly, truly I say to you statement, which is when Jesus is saying that kind of phrase, He's speaking as the authoritative Son of God. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he distinguishes the nature of flesh and spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's come to restore the dead spirit of humanity and their relationship with God. And this is occurring just after in John at the end of chapter 1 is the interaction between Jesus and John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, and the dynamic that he brings to that, and John bears witness to this, is John says, I'm only baptizing you with water, but the one who's coming after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, which of course is talking about Pentecost. So Jesus is referencing His baptism at the hands of John, but He's also combining the words of the baptism of John with Him, Himself, the One who can send the Spirit. The Spirit, as I said which to, to, in the children's message to the kids, kills the old you and makes the new you alive. Then Jesus says His third truly, truly, I say to you statement. He says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. That's sort of the fickle nature of a promise. The only way to receive a promise is to believe that the person who's making it will do what they say. There's no other way. And Jesus here is referring to a we in not just Himself, but the witness of all the Scriptures which He's been explaining to Nicodemus. We speak to you of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. You do not receive our account. And then He, he makes an appeal to His own authority to illustrate that This is what Nicodemus ought to do. Believe what I am saying to you. He says that no one knows the things of heaven except the one who's descended from heaven, which is the Son of Man, and He is the Son of Man. And then he gives perhaps the most shocking, not perhaps, the most shocking deviation from what we think is necessary to fulfill the promises that God has made to His people going all the way back to Abram and that is the death of the Son of God, the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus says here towards the end of His conversation with Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. That's how God is fulfilling His promise to you, the same promise He made to Abram, many, many years ago. That is how, through Abram and the promised family and people of God, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through the lifting up of the Son of Man. And then, of course, we come to the famous verse that everybody knows, John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. And here Jesus distinguishes from Nicodemus' worldview what exactly God is doing. Nicodemus is all about the law and the fulfillment of the law, and here Jesus is saying the gospel, that God is fulfilling the law on your behalf, paying the price of your failure in your place, and giving you the price of His success, a right relationship with God, a perfect, holy righteousness, and life forever. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him." It turns out that as God fulfills His promises, He doesn't want condemnation and judgment for failure, but He wants salvation. Salvation for the failure, the sinner, the unworthy. Dear friends in Christ, God's promise is a gift. It's a gift of His work on your behalf, a gift given to you when you are baptized, where you receive His name and His Spirit, a gift continually given to you at the altar of His table through the fruits of the cross, the fulfillment of all God's promises 
to you. That God, through Jesus' death and resurrection, fulfills His promise to you and to Abraham and to everyone that He has saved you and that you are His. In the name of Jesus, amen.